Well, good afternoon and welcome to Zoom Time Knowledge. This is a free public education series provided by the James Madison University Lifelong Learning Institute. My name is Rodney Wolfenbarger. I serve as director of the program. Uh, you've just heard from Sue G, who is program assistant. She is managing uh, today's meeting technology and hosting the meeting. Sue, thank you for your assistance. Uh, we also have our special guest presenter today, Dale McAllister. Adele is a graduate of Bridgewater College and James Madison University. He's also past president of the Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society and a longtime writer and publisher of the Shenandoah Valley Folklife Society newsletter. Adele has spent decades researching and writing about the families, history, and culture of Harrisonburg and Rockingham County, as well as the broader Shenandoah Valley. Uh, as you all know, we're, we're thankful that you're here with us on this election day. Uh, we've hoped that you've had opportunity to cast your ballot, exercise your right to vote. And Dale, I think it's appropriate that today we're discussing the life and legacy of Lucy Sims, someone who dedicated their life to public service. Uh, Dale, thank you. Welcome. Uh, really appreciate you volunteering your time, coming all the way down to the Ice House uh, to present uh, uh, on location. And whenever you're ready, Sue and I will stand by to make sure that everybody's needs are taken care of with regard to the technology and you can begin screen sharing whenever you're ready. I'm, I'm glad to be here today to share a little bit about the life of Lucy Francis Sims. I've worked on studying her and researching about her for more than 20 years and was pleased to have a book that I authored a, bi a, a biography of Lucy Sims. It came from the publisher, from the printer in April and um, it's been languishing in boxes since then because of COVID-19. Last week, we introduced it to the public. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about that today through a PowerPoint presentation. So we'll get started. Lucy Francis Sims from slavery, slavery to revered public service. And there's a picture of the front cover of the book. That's one of the best photos we have of Lucy Sims. You'll get to see many more in this presentation, but um, you'll also see where this came from, from a picture, framed picture that now hangs in the Sims Continuing Education Center. The Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society, which has been rebranded as Rocktown History, they've been tasked with handling the sales of the biography and all proceeds from the sales of that book go to the society. One of the major goals from the beginning of the project was to provide free copies of the Sims biography to history classes in all Harrisonburg City and Rockingham County high schools, especially the classes that teach Virginia history and of 500 softbound uh, books have been saved to, to distribute to those high schools. So let's take an overview about Lucy Sims. Lucy was born about 1856 to James Sims, a slave of the Gray family who lived at Hilltop Farm in Harrisonburg. Her father is really unknown. Um, census records classify her as a mulatto, which means of mixed blood. So there is white blood in her ancestry someplace. Lucy Sims, her mother Jane, and her grandmother Lucy were all slaves for the Algernon Gray family. And here's a map. This is from Gray's Atlas of 1877 that included some, it was a, a, a wide ranging map, but it included some maps of Harrisonburg and Bridgewater. And this is the one about one of the maps of Harrisonburg. And you'll notice that this is the Valley Turnpike. 
US 11 North. Here we have our uh, Washington Street coming off of North Main. Hilltop Farm is here. You see R.A. Gray at the um, houses there or buildings there along Washington Street. He was Robert A. Gray, who was Algernon Gray's brother, and he had moved there on the farm after the Civil War. And then here close by is Newtown Cemetery. So we're in Northeast Harrisonburg in the area that was called Newtown. Hilltop was located where the present site of Ralph Sampson Park is in Harrisonburg, along East Washington Street. And the home had been built for Algernon Gray. The Sims family were slaves that lived there uh, in the Algernon Gray household and on the farm. The home actually burned in 1869 and had nothing to do with the Civil War, but was uh, few years afterward, and there are no known photographs of the house, but the Historical Society has this fantastic panoramic painting of Harrisonburg done by Emma Lyon Bryan in 1867, and she shows the hilltop house. You probably can tell from the color that it was brick. It, it's a very indistinct image, but it's the only thing we have of the farmhouse shown on the crest of the hill in her painting. The Gray family, uh, the, the head of the family here was Irish-born Robert Gray, who uh, lived from 1781 to 1859. And he was a lawyer and civic leader. He came to Virginia in 1785 and moved on to Harrisonburg in 1805. In 1812, he married Isabel Waterman of Harrisonburg, and she is of the Waterman family that Waterman Elementary School is named after, and also one of the streets in town, Waterman Drive. Robert and Isabella built the important home called a cello. Now, I, I call it cello because it's Monticello. Uh, this one meant a, a house on a, a rise of land. Robert and Isabella built the important house, Colicello, on the north end of Harrisonburg. It was located about where the poultry plant is, close to the, the tall feed mills in, off of North Main Street, close to um, Crotzer Road, end of Liberty Street. And Robert Gray, also built houses for his sons. The house for his son, Charles David Gray, was called Inglewood, and it's built north of Harrisonburg off of Crotcher Road, where um, the former LLRR Donnelly was, uh, is located, which is now uh, LCS Communications or something. Anyway, that was across from there. That house still stands. And as mentioned the earlier, house of uh, Algernon Gray at, at Hilltop was also a gift from his father when he got married. And then after the Civil War, as I mentioned, Robert A. Gray moved to Hilltop and Algernon then went to Colicello. So the Hilltop location, if you know where Ralph Sampson Park is on that part of Harrisonburg along Water Street, uh, Washington Street rather, the Hilltop Mansion set about where this picnic shelter is up at the top of the hill. And in fact, when they were excavating to pour the slab for that picnic shelter a few years ago, they unearthed shards and artifacts and a structural wall that probably were part of the, the main buildings there on Hilltop Farm. Um, one of the walls was probably, it, it may have been the main house, which burned, but it may have also been one of the other buildings, uh, perhaps the slave quarters on Hilltop Farm. And those slave quarters were standing even into the 20th century there on that farm. Lucy's schooling. Lucy Sims 
attended the color schools of Harrisonburg from about 1866. That would have been a year after the Civil War ended. And then she went on to attend Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia in 1874. The Gray family have been said to have helped her gain admission there to Hampton Institute. And there's a picture of Virginia Hall, which was one of the buildings on campus when Lucy attended there. Here we have an engraving of a um, classroom at Hampton, what it would have looked like with the unusual, probably gas light in the room. Lucy completed her courses at Hampton Institute in 1877. So she was there for three years and she earned a teacher certificate. Hampton did, wasn't able to confer uh, bachelor's degrees until the 1920s. So she earned no uh, specific degree, but she had attended long enough and took teacher training classes to allow her to have a first rate uh, certificate to teach in Virginia schools. And here's what another Hampton student talked about um, uh, by Lucy Sims. One, one evening at chapel, several speakers were called upon. Tired with the day's work and study, I did not relish the idea of sitting through a talk by another man just called upon. I looked at him. This man doesn't know anything, I thought. What are they calling on him for? It was Booker T. Washington, little known to many of us at that time. I was soon thoroughly awake when his ability and eloquence began to show itself. I remember he said that in Philadelphia, he saw busts of great men and that he had resolved to put his there also. Of course, he eventually did. Hampton was a very successful school and primarily responsible for that was the strong leadership of General Samuel C. Armstrong. During the Civil War, he had led the U.S. Colored Troops. After the war, he joined the Freedmen's Bureau, and we'll talk more about that bureau later. And he became uh, head of the Freedmen's Bureau in Virginia in 1866. With the help of the American Missionary Association, he started Hampton Institute to train African Americans to become teachers, but also skilled workers. And as you might expect, Lucy Sims held General Armstrong in high esteem. In the fall of 1877, that earlier that year, she had finished at Hampton Institute and she began teaching in the one room school called Athens Covered School that was held in Long's Chapel, northeast of Melrose in this county. The Athens community was named Zenda later on when they tried to get a post office in, their, in that community because Athens would have been used someplace else in the post office name in Virginia. And so they couldn't use that for the post office here. The Zenda name is a, a fictitious name in a novel, The Prisoner of Zenda that was popular in the 1890s. So the map shows us a couple things. It shows us, in, well, over here on the left edge is the Valley Turnpike. And this Mount Tabor is about where Mount Tabor United Methodist Church is now uh, south of Lacey Spring. Indian Trail Road is one of the oldest roads through the county. If you've ever gotten on Indian Trail, and driven over it, you know, it just follows the, the lay of the land. It has almost no, uh, no work having been done to straighten it out or make it smoother and so forth. And then here we have the Athens community. And there is Long's Chapel, the building in which she taught that first year. This map comes out of Lakes Atlas of Rockingham County. Uh, done in 1885. And here's a picture of the, the Long's Chapel building in Athens prior to its restoration. The church was built about 1871 with the help of the United Brethren in Christ Church. 
because the United Brethren were anti-slavery. And after the Civil War, they decided that they were gonna use some of their mission outreach money to help the newly freed slaves. And then here we have a photo of the church after it had been restored. Now, if you were to go by there today, you'd see a nice uh, wheelchair access ramp around it and a number of things, um, fence in the adjoining cemetery and so forth. Over here on this edge of this picture, you can see the roadside marker and here's what it looks like here. It talks about how, how it was built in about 1870, 1871, and who gave the land for the church and so forth. But it also mentions Lucy Sims and it says, the school where notable Harrisonburg educator Lucy Sims began her career closed in 1925. Now it's not this one, we're not talking about when the church closed because a few years after Lucy left her teaching job there, Lindell District within Rockingham County had a school called Athens Colored School built up the hillside um, east of the location of this church. What about the Athens community? Well, the former slaves were sold land there after the Civil War. And most of the families living near Long's Chapel were African-American. Since Athens was a substantial distance from Sims Harrisonburg home, she needed to find lodging close to the school. There was uh, uh, some work done a number of years ago about Lucy in this school, and it talked about her, her traveling on foot from Harrisonburg to her school. Well, it was just too far. She needed to live close to the school, as all teachers did at that time, unless they had a horse that they could use or a buggy, which is less likely. So she was able to find room and board in the home of a local African-American blacksmith and live with his family for that year. For the next school year, in the fall of 1878, Lucy began teaching African-American girls in the basement of a, a church in Harrisonburg. She had kind of made up her mind that she was gonna to go to Maryland because she heard that salaries were so much better in Maryland but the Rockingham County Superintendent of Schools persuaded Lucy and her best friend to uh, come to Harrisonburg and teach in their schools. It's not known which church exactly she was in that year, but because the basements of two churches were used as locations for teaching early African American students, they were separated on the basis of gender. The Whipple School, we'll talk more about this later, but this is the, the school that she began teaching in in Harrisonburg in 1880. It was a long blocks run in Harrisonburg. It was the first school built specifically for African-Americans in Harrisonburg. It was located at sort of the back end of that sandcar building that has apartments in it now. And um, Lucy Sims herself had probably been a student in this very same schoolhouse. So let's take a look at this a minute, the, the map. So here we have Rock Street. And here you can see Black's Run going through Harrisonburg. And the schoolhouse is right there beside Black's Run. And it's listed as a colored school on the 1885 map. The next school she taught at was in 1883, the Whipple School was a little too little for the student numbers. So Harrisonburg built a new school called Harrisonburg Colored School on Effinger Street in Northeast Harrisonburg. And the top photo is the look of the original four room building with the, the top having that nice cupola on top. And she continued teaching in that school for the rest of her life, 51 years until her death in 1934. Her teaching career spanned an amazing 57 years all told. That's 
one year in Rockingham County and 56 years in Harrisonburg. And the, the bottom picture is a picture of the building, the Effinger Street School, after the 1910 addition. And the addition was on this side of the building. The original school was over here. Although Lucy Sims had experienced some declining health issues, she died unexpectedly in July 1934. She was found by a neighbor slumped over her front porch railing, deceased, and people speculate that she had probably gone to the front porch to seek help and uh, died there over that railing. She was buried in Newtown Cemetery beside her mother, her beloved mother, in July of 1934. So the, the left picture is Lucy Sims Stone, and the right picture is Lucy Sims' mother, Jane Sims Wilson, who died in 1908. In 1934, we'll talk about some of her honors here. There are many, many more included in the book, but the very first one, in 1934, the same year that she died, Harrisonburg City Council named the playground along East Washington Street, the Lucy F. Sims Athletic Field. And then in 1939, this, this construction began in 38, but in 39, when the school opened, and it is on Sims Avenue, so the street itself was named for her family. This building was named in honor of, in honor of Lucy Frances Sims. Here's some pictures of her through the years from the young Miss Sims on through Lucy Sims in her later years. She was always um, a, a great dresser. She really prided her looks and uh, dressed, dressed very appropriately for the classroom. Now let's check into the family a little bit beyond Lucy. Lucy had a, an older brother named John Sims, and John, who grew up in Harrisonburg then, spent most of his life working for the federal government in Washington, D.C. In his last work in Washington, he was in the Bureau of Printing and Engraving. Lucy also had an older sister, Ellen Sims, who married Peter Allen, also a Harrisonburg person, and they lived in Harrisonburg. And one amazing thing, the 1900 census, which would list how many children a woman had and then how many were still living, indicated that Ellen Sims had given birth to 10 children, but only two were still living in 1900. Their mother, Jane Sims, married Robert P. Wilson after the Civil War when marriage was allowed. And Robert and Jane Sims Wilson had one son. He was named Ulysses Grant Wilson, and people called him UG. He used his initials. He would have been a half brother to the three older children of Jane Sims. UG Wilson was also a school teacher. He spent his first years teaching in Rockingham County Colored School. One of them was the Mount Crawford Colored School. And I think he was also in Pleasant Valley Colored School. Wilson then came to Harrisonburg and taught with his sister Lucy in the Effinger Street School for 24 years. He was also a writer and poet. Although he lived into the 1940s, we were not able to find a photograph of him. That's my one regret about the book. Nobody seemed to have a photograph of him. He didn't die until 1943, and he was a uh, music director at his Harrisonburg church for 30 years or more, but nobody seemed to have a photograph of him. The Sims biography came, uh, includes some examples of his poetry. He wrote a poem about the big, um, the big spring on Court Square in Harrisonburg and some other local topics, but most of his poetry was in what I'll call Negro dialect, which is probably not very politically correct these days. The research story. 
what were some of the things I used to find out about Lucy? Well, to begin with, in uh, about 19, uh, well, 1990s, I started writing some things about her, and we'll see about that in just a minute. But in 2005, I was asked to give a talk about Lucy Sims to the op shop that moved into the Sims basement. The Sims building had been renovated and that was being completed in 2005. So I created a PowerPoint presentation to take there to talk with them about. And that was um, the PowerPoint you see there on the right-hand side. And if you notice the, the name with me was Paige Cayley. She was a Turner Ashby High School uh, senior who did some intern work throughout the school year at the museum in Dayton and helped me with some projects, uh, some, some primarily African-American projects during that year. I also began researching and working on an eventual 20 page paper about Lucy Sims to gather together facts about her life and you can see what it was called there. And I finally did a revision of it in 2016. When Larry Huffman's semester classes called Foundations of Education at JMU covered African-American education, Larry would ask me to come in and present a modified and expanded PowerPoint presentation about Ms. Sims as a model of African-American teacher success. So I also, uh, broaden that presentation by giving some, some examples of African-American education. And I showed it to his two classes in the fall, two in the spring for many years. I, I got um, lucky to have received some files from Hampton Institute. Bill O'Harper, who's the son of Doris Harper Allen, was a graduate of Sims School, and he shared some correspondence and postcards and letters from the Lucy Sims file at Hampton Institute. They had, had kept a lot of information about Lucy Sims. The materials were originally obtained by Mary Alker Fairfax, who taught in Sims School for many years, including until 1966 when Sims School closed. Also, the Carrier Library at James Madison University, special collections there, had transcriptions of many interviews that were taped with former students of Lucy Sims. They also had photographs of Sims classes. One of the persons interviewed was uh, Elon Rhodes, who was a member of Harrisonburg City Council, and he, get, he gave them his impressions of Lucy Sims, but so did many other citizens of Newtown and Harrisonburg. Those interviewed described what they remembered about Ms. Sims, and those remembrances really helped provide information about what she was like as a teacher, as a citizen, and a cherished member of her community. Also, Hampton Institute had some publications that were useful, um, that had references to Lucy Sims. On the left, the Southern Workman, was their uh, periodical that they published occasionally. And some of the Gray family from Harrisonburg uh, sent articles to that that would even mention some of the Sims as after how they were doing after slavery. And then their catalog there, you can see maybe it's pretty small, but it says the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute Hampton, Virginia. That was the official name of Hampton Institute. The normal means that they were a teacher preparation school and the Agricultural Institute was to teach agricultural skills to the men in the school. Also writings by the Gray family helped in addition to what they had written for Hampton. Or a Gray Langer, and Nettie Gray Dangerfield were both daughters of Algernon Gray of Hilltop, and they both wrote about former slaves in the family. And this book called Our Mammy and Other Stories was written by Nettie Gray Dangerfield in 1906. 
It included information about the Sims family and photos of some of their former slaves. So some of the slave photos I have in the book were actually from this book uh, done in 1906. Some milestones. Let's examine two special milestones in Virginia history that Lucy Sims experienced personally. The first has to do with public education. And the second, how, how appropriate could it be on election day and it involves the right to vote. The 150th anniversary of public education in Virginia. Well, after the Civil War, the Virginia had lost the war and the US government required Virginia to pass a new constitution in order to be readmitted to the Union and get out from under federal control of what was called Military District 1, the classification of Virginia, Virginia following the war. And um, this was forced on the state. The Constitutional Convention called to write a new uh, constitution ended in April of 1868. And in that constitution, it called for a creation of a state system of free public education for both black and white students. And also another provision in the constitution gave African-American men the right to vote. So Lucy's brother, Eugene Wilson, got his right to vote when he turned 21, much earlier than she did, as we'll see in a moment. A statewide referendum then voted on the new constitution in July, 1869. And at that point, it was officially adopted by the statewide vote. Statewide public education on a small scale began in late 1870 in most parts of the state, including here in Harrisonburg. And this year then, 2020, marks the sesquicentennial, 150 years since free public education for all began in Virginia. So it's sort of a very important milestone 150 years ago. Public education in Harrisonburg. Well, Lucy would have been about 14 years old when Harrisonburg established public schools for all students, white and black. And she certainly would have attended public schools in Harrisonburg at that time. And unlike many students at Hampton Institute, she needed no remedial classes to prepare her for her advanced work there. Her education had been good enough that she just moved right on in with the advanced classes when she got there. The second milestone, this is the mark of a century of women's suffrage. 2020 also marks a century for another milestone in Virginia and the nation, the right for women to vote. The 19th Amendment made it illegal to deny this right in federal elections. The amendment was passed by Congress in 1919 and by the required number of states in 1920 to become federal law. And the ever-minded, civic-minded Lucy Sims wasted little time. She registered to vote in 1920 her uh, registration is still in the courthouse in Harrisonburg. And she was ready to vote in that 1920 presidential election. In that election, Warren G. Harding, a senator from Ohio, ran against Ohio Governor James M. Cox. And all women in Virginia, including Liz Lucy Sims, had to do the following in order to vote. These were the requirements. You had to be at least 21 years old, be a current resident, and register to vote and pay one year's poll tax by at least 30 days before the election. And the poll tax at that time was $1.50. Amazingly, Virginia didn't ratify the 19th Amendment until 1952, many years after the amendment passed. Early African-American education in Harrisonburg, let's take a look at some of that we'll kind of go back to the beginning. School for African Americans in Harrisonburg did begin in 1866. That was four years before public education, but um, Lucy Sims would have been about 10 years old at the time and certainly would have been in these schools. 
The first schools were organized by Northern religious societies and taught by teachers sent here from New England by missionary societies of various churches. Uh, the first ones actually were from Maine. Most of them were from Maine and I think one from New Hampshire. And these first teachers represented the Free Will Baptist Church here in Harrisonburg. Here's what Booker T. Washington said about those first African-American schools and their teachers. This was in his autobiography, Up From Slavery. Whenever it is written, the part that the Yankee teachers played in the education of the Negroes immediately after the war will make one of the most thrilling parts in the history of this country. So he obviously was impressed with that early education of those Northern teachers, primarily women. The first schools the, in Harrisonburg for African-Americans were held in rented quarters in Harrisonburg. At that time, the boys and the girls were taught in separate buildings. And one of those schools was in a hotel about where the present public safety building is on North Main Street. And the students had an upstairs room where they were taught, at least the girls. The Freedmen's Bureau and the U.S. Christian Commission both created to help former slaves work as responsible for those uh, two schools or those early schools. And here we have an engraving of a Freedmen's Bureau school. And then here we have uh, the logo for the U.S. Christian Commission. They both helped financially get these schools started. Now, what about this Freedmen's Bureau? It was formerly known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, but the agency often went by the simple Freedmen's Bureau title. It was created by Congress in 1865 to provide education <coughs> and medical care to former slaves and poor whites and to protect their rights. It became a major, major ed educational force for African-American education in Harrisonburg. And here we have the Whipple Schoolhouse. Notice the asterisk beside Whipple. And down at the bottom, it says, the Whipple name, it's an unusual name. It's from George Whipple, a founder of the American Missionary Association, which was a major promoter of black education in the South. The association helped build many schools and churches in the post-war South, including Hampton Institute. So that little old schoolhouse by the creek that we looked at on the map, the Whipple Schoolhouse, was built through funds from the Freedmen's Bureau in 1868, near Rock Street and beside Black's Run. By 1882, the Whipple Schoolhouse was too small for the number of students, and that's when Harrisonburg began building the four-room school on Effinger Street that we saw the picture of earlier. And um, although it was called the Harrisonburg Colored School officially, the school was mostly called the Effinger Street School. That school opened in 1883. Let's look at some photos of Lucy. Here she is in a class with 57 students in front of the building. 57, one classroom. One thing you may notice, she was primarily known later in her life for teaching first or second grade or maybe both, but some of her early years, you'll see people, see students that are older than first and second graders. As in this one, this was her Effinger school class in 1908. And um, someone has written numbers on this and identify the people in the back. And you can see Lucy here as she's shown in this, this single photo. Here she is with 31 students. And here, first and second grade students, 33 of them, with an older Lucy Sims, 1928. Uh, 
around that time, about six years before her final teaching. You may have seen this famous photo because it's been used a lot in the daily news record. And the, the uh, emphasis of this one was that here she was with three generations of her students. Uh, who we have here are left to right, Roberta Wells Weaver Greenlaw, then her mother, Helen Irvin Wells, and her grandmother, Roberta Irvin, and of course, the Sims. And Roberta Greenlaw, this young lady, born 1923, died 10 years ago. She was a granddaughter of General J.R. Jones, Harrisonburg's only Confederate general. And um, General Jones had children by two of his housekeepers, two of his African-American housekeepers. And um, the mother is, the mother here, is married to one of those children. And then this is the grandchild. Whoops. And that's the grandchild. She was a teacher in the Chicago area when she died in 2010. And then here's another one that's been in the paper a good bit or in publications. This photograph was taken in 1980 by the Historical Society. They were doing a booklet about an uh, exhibit they had in the building that's now Harrisonburg's Quilt Museum where they were located at that time. And it shows from left to right, Amanda McCall, Mary Alkard Fairfax in the center, and then Lester McCall, husband of, of Amanda on the right. The McCalls somehow helped preserve that picture of Lucy Sims, and that's the one that's hanging in the hallway at the Sims Continuing Education Center right now. And this is the special photo of a young Lucy that graces the cover of her biography. Mrs. McCall, probably this is the way she located the picture. She began the cafeteria services at Effinger Street School in the mid 30s and was the first cafeteria manager at Lucy Sims School in 1939. And then this new information came after most of the book had been finished, but it, it turned out to be so important that we stuck it in, in the back of the biography. This is a letter written in uh, August of 1903 from William H. Keister, his picture here in the namesake of Keister Elementary School. He was a longtime leader of Harrisonburg schools. And he sent this to Lucy Sims and it became known to me only after the book finished. It was found in Harrisonburg City Schools records. It hadn't turned up until this uh, April or this February, really. It gives information about who Lucy hoped to marry and what her future plans were. And as I said, it's in the back of the book. Well, what did we know before this letter turned up? We knew that Lucy Sims was once engaged. At that time, her mother Jane became ill and Lucy moved in to take care of her in the house that's the Lucy Sims house on Johnson, East Johnson Street. The fiance was said to have become tired of waiting for Lucy and broke off the engagement. And we didn't know anything else about the situation. So what did the letter reveal? Well, Lucy says that she felt that 25 years of teaching was sufficient and that it was time to get married. And she would have been about 46 years old at this time. And we learned the name of her fiance. He, he was a Mr. Braswell. And he must have lived in Florida because she talked about, uh, she thought she'd be moving there, but she still planned to be in Harrisonburg for the start of the 1903-4 school year. And this is what William Keister wrote about Miss Sims in his letter. He said, you've been a source of inspiration to me many times. 
I had never heard a word of complaint as to your teaching from any parent. And then his closing was probably the best thing. He said, I am very sincerely with a heart full of gratitude for all you have done for me and taught me in looking on the good side of things. So it, it sort of emphasizes the fact that Lucy Sims always was a positive person and looked for the good side when bad things happened. And there's that picture again in the book with the picture. And then if you're interested in buying the book, I'll remind you that the Historical Society gets all the proceeds for the sales and you can go buy and buy in person. I would check to be sure they're open because sometimes they're not open all days of the week due to COVID-19 problems, but they are open most of the week. You can buy it in person, or you can also get online orders by logging on to rocktownhistory.org and then click on welcome and then on shop. And you'll see the picture of the book shown right there. So that includes the PowerPoint. Hey, Dale, thank you uh, for that presentation. And for many, it may be an introduction to Lucy Sims. Um, I know I was familiar with the Lucy Sims Center, which LLI has used at various times for programs, uh, but I didn't know about the earlier schools. And, and that, that, that's really helped fill in the gaps of my understanding as a fairly new resident of Harrisonburg. I know we have a lot of members who relocate to the valley uh, in or around Harrisonburg, maybe their first introduction uh, to Lucy Sims. We do have a few questions here and then we will open it up for, um, we will extend microphone access, but there are three in the chat window. Uh, the first one comes from Pat and Pat asks, uh, how did the city of Harrisonburg grow from 1900 to 1930? And I just wanna repeat the question, uh, as we respond to them for those who may not have access or see that chat window. How did it grow from 1900 to 1930? Yes. Well, uh, I don't think anything was too remarkable. It, it just grew at sort of a, a normal pace that any town would have grown at that time. Of course, by 1930, there was a, a depression wide depression, one of the worst ever. And um, at that point, things would have slowed down for a while. Even uh, the, the city schools would have been cutting salaries for teachers to make ends meet. Um, in the case of Newtown, I think most of the growth had been there before 1900. And um, of, of course, most people know that in the late 1950s and early 1960s, much of Newtown was burned or destroyed, torn down for urban development. And uh, a lot of buildings that really weren't that bad a condition ended up being destroyed to make way for, for new buildings, um, new housing, and uh, very few of the businesses that existed at that time survived. One of the few that remained after its building was torn down was Klein's Ice Cream. But most of the black businesses didn't make it through the renewal efforts. Dale, the, the next question, and I know we will have some audio comments. I see some people with the virtual hand raised up. But there are two more questions in the chat window before we extend microphone access. Uh, the title of your book, uh, this new book, is uh, Lucy Francis Sims from Slavery to Revered Public Servant. This question says, when was Miss Sims emancipated? And was she freed as a result of the Civil War? Or, um, 
what are the circumstances? Well, for one thing, um, yes, Abraham Lincoln emancipated the slaves, but that didn't take effect in the South. They had no control over the South at that time. The Confederacy was controlling the South. So that wasn't an, an effective um, order until the end of the Civil War. So she was born about 1856 and would have lived about nine years under slavery. And when the Civil War ended, that's when she became officially emancipated. And Dell, the third question comes from Joy. And Joy wants to know what prompted your interest in Miss Sims and how long have you been researching her life? I um, was interested in her for, for one thing. I taught 33 years, uh, taught eighth graders at Broadway for 33 years. And I thought that was quite enough time to think that somebody could teach 57 years and still be planning to teach another year uh, that summer that she died. She had every, every uh, reason to keep teaching. Um, it was very impressive. And so I knew a little bit about her, but I thought people needed to, to know a lot more about her. And that's why I started that, that report, that 20, eventually 20 page report about her was so that more people would know about Lucy Sims. Over the years, she was included in the newspaper a good bit as far as remembering her after she had died. So there was some general knowledge of not everything was correct. And one thing I tried to do in the book is, is go through some arguments about why certain things are correct. For instance, her um, death date, of course, was fixed. Her birth date, not so much. There were all kinds of speculations about which year she was born. Uh, the census records very different, were different every census about when she would have been born. And so I think it's probably the best uh, date, 1856, which is what her, her tombstone says. And that would have been provided that date by her brother, her half brother, E.G. Wilson. So I think he probably knew the most about when she really was born. He would have been born about 10 years after her. Uh, Dell, the next question I'm going to ask Bud Dershel to unmute. Uh, Bud, I will send you a prompt. Uh, the other thing is, Bud, I want to thank you. you. You are a volunteer member of our events and lectures committee. And um, not the reason I'm calling on you next, you just have your hand up. Uh, but I do want to thank you for coordinating this presentation with Dell. I think you extended the invitation and uh, really made this possible. So I'm going to ask you to unmute and you should be able to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a backstory to this. I think I wanted Dale to mention how someone like you um, had the motivation to do this kind of research. I believe there was somebody in your uh, family who gave you this uh, incentive to delve into the to history and just uh, led you on this path? Well, I had a, an uncle who lived in Singer's Glen where I live. And um, he, after the World War I, he served in the uh, Army Air Force in England during World War I. And when he came back here, he went to Ohio for his professional career. And uh, when he retired in the late 1940s, he moved back to Singer's Glen and spent a lot of his time researching local history, primarily to do genealogies. And he walked all kinds of uh, cemeteries in the part of Rockingham County, west of Route 11, and eventually wrote some books with the records in and so forth. And so he used to talk to me a lot about local history and it got me interested in it. And so I'd have to say he was my inspiration for being interested in local history. In school, I didn't teach history at all. I was a physics major at both Bridgewater College and JMU. And so I taught eighth grade physical science it had nothing to do with history in school. I had, I had one other, if you, if I, if you don't mind, uh, I was interested in, uh, 
the quality of the education that she uh, provided. And is, is, is she a very unusual case? Are there other wonderful examples like this of, of uh, uh, former slaves who went to Hampton and ended up being these wonderful teachers? They went to other places. Uh, maybe you don't know anything about that, but I, I'm just thinking, is this something that was so very unique or this is what uh, some of the former slaves got into and they became wonderful teachers? Well, certainly uh, becoming a teacher was something that was uh, well tolerated in the society that became increasingly Jim Crow over the years. A teacher was a necessary part of society. But um, the book includes some people that also attended Hampton Institute and uh, came to Harrisonburg and taught, or it mentions some other people that she knew that, that also taught. But um, Hampton was trying to do one thing, and that was prepare their students for a life of work that was rewarding and satisfying. For the women, it was the teaching aspect. For the men, it was primarily teaching skills, carpentry skills, building skills, and so forth, looking for that same uh, satisfactory job after school. And um, one thing I'll say about the Sims education, there were a lot of people in Rockingham County in the African-American schools during the time that she was a teacher, especially before 1900, they had a better education than almost all of the Rockingham County school teachers because they had actually studied at Hampton for three years there were a lot of young women in Rockingham County who were uh, high school graduates, maybe even not a four-year high school, maybe a three-year high school or two-year, who were teaching. They would be sent to some uh, remote one-room school, and um, if they survived there, perhaps they got a better school the next year, but they probably pr promised the school superintendent that they would take some teacher training classes. And so in the spring and summer times, they would often attend what were called normal institutes or something like that to become better educated. But at one point, all of the African-American teachers in the county were graduates of Hampton Institute. So it was very widespread for us. And we do have microphone access for uh, others, but if you want to follow up, you'll have to unmute your microphone again. Excuse me, did she leave any papers? Any correspondence? The only correspondence is uh, what was down at Hampton because she wrote letters to them, she wrote on postcards to them and uh, um, submitted things that they were gonna print in their publications about former students. And so that's really the only thing much. Um, the Historical Society, one of the amazing things that happened when there was a lady working in food services at JMU who bought the Sims house in, in the 1990s and she was fixing it up and found some things in the house. I'm not sure if they were in the attic or exactly where they were, but one of the things she found was a Bible that Lucy Sims' name was in front of and the date of the year 1908 that her mother died. So she had bought that Bible that, uh, that year her mother died. It was a, a very jarring experience for her when her mother did die. But also in those materials was a notebook that her half-brother, Eugene Wilson, used in teaching school and he had speeches in it and uh, writing assignments and things like that that he was using with his students. But uh, there, there was really nothing from Lucy as far as writing there. But one interesting letter was included in that material. Her mother, Jane Sims, had sisters who had been born here in Harrisonburg, but a lot of them had moved away from here. And um, this, this sister, Maggie, was living in Illinois 
and she wrote back to Jane Sims Wilson. So it's the only correspondence I had for Lucy's mother. And it mentioned a lot of the siblings in the letter, which sort of confirmed who some of those sisters, primarily sisters, were in that, in that uh, Sims family originally. Interesting. I have a question. Um, you can mute yourself. No, no. Uh, yes, I was just wondering what kind of compensation Lucy Sims had and how it compared to white teachers at the time. Well, it was always less. For instance, uh, she might have been getting $18 a month, and the white teachers were probably getting $22, $24, or more. Okay. So it was never, never equal. Even though her, her certificate was a number one certificate, which was the highest you could have. Mm -hmm. And so was her brother, Eugene Wilson's, because he'd also had college training. But uh, a lot of teachers were teaching with provisional certificates or a two or a three, which were not nearly as well prepared as Lucy was. Thank you. Mr. McAllister, what do you know about the inspiration for the family who owned her and her family to send her to school and provide her so much education? Well, the Gray family, um, they were not um, promoters of the Civil War. They, they, they were federal Federalists, they were Unionists, and um, even though they enslaved the Sims family and others, many others, they always kept their welfare in mind. And so Lucy probably had had some education. You know, people think about it was illegal to teach uh, a slave, but it wasn't illegal to teach the slave if you did it in your own house. What was illegal was if you did it in a public building or a public setting. You could always teach them at home. And it was often the women in the family or especially the children, the daughters, who would do that teaching. The main goal of it was make them be well, be, um, well enough reading that they could read the Bible. So that was sort of the inspiration for a lot of that, that teaching. But anyway, that family had members in who did help and learn how to read and write uh, before the Civil War. So that, that was sort of an advantage from the first. But um, then after the war, the daughters were always interested in the slaves. And there are many instances in their writings where they talk about this, the one daughter, Aura. Aura Gray married a Langer and moved to Lynchburg. And she often rode the train back from Lynchburg to Harrisonburg to visit. And she would talk about going back and visiting Lucy's grandmother, who was their, their uh, house cook, their main cook in their household, and also visiting Lucy's mother, who was living in the house that eventually became Lucy's house. So they, they were always interested in their welfare and kept in touch with them. And they would try, like, um, there were instances where the school, the Effinger Street School, wanted to have a program in uh, some large facilities. And they asked to use the, a room in the courthouse. And they were refused. And some of the white citizens complained about it and finally got them permission to use that building. And a lot of white folks uh, attended that building and some of the prime movers in getting them permission for that were the Gray family. So they, they really always had an interest for that even though, and they apparently were, were um, they, they weren't cruel slave masters because Lucy's sister named one of her children for one of the Gray family members. Now, they gave him as the great family members first, middle, and last name as their first and two middle names. So to do that, they would have had to admire 
the gray family. Yeah, any known um, descendants of the brother or the sister? Well, um, Bo Dickinson, who helped with our production last week when we introduced the book, tried to help me find somebody that had a picture of UG Wilson. And he has grandchildren that live in the Philadelphia area, but we couldn't get a response from them to see if maybe they knew where a photo of Wilson was. And um, of course, Lucy never married, had no children. And um, the brother, John Sims, who worked at Bureau of Printing and Engraving, he had no children, although he was married. And um, the line that extends to current days is through Eugene Wilson, the half brother. So there are some members in that family still living. I do have one. Well, the book has a, a bunch of appendices in it, and um, maybe I should mention what those include because they're they're somewhat um, edifying. There are appendices that tell all the teachers who taught from um, the beginning. 1866 to the end of Eppinger Street School. And I also have uh, an appendix about Eppinger Street School where I give more information about that. I have one called what Early American African American Education in Harrisonburg talks about that in general. Then appendix D is the Sims Wilson family. And that's when it goes into some genealogy on that family. Um, Appendix E is a list of rules and regulations that were in effect for, for te uh, pupils and teachers at Eppinger Street School. And so a lot of the, the more detailed information is included in the appendices. Dell, you had mentioned uh, one of the sources, I think, uh, during the presentation was that there were some collected um, responses from people who had actually been educated by Lucy Sims. What were some of their remembrances like of her as a teacher, as having been in a classroom with her? Well, uh, one, one major theme, I guess, is that she was a no-nonsense no teacher. She didn't, uh, didn't tolerate any messing around in the classroom. And she used her ruler <laughs> with a passion on people that misbehaved. So she she ran a a tight ship in her classroom. But the students loved her. Uh, overall, nobody had anything bad about her to say. They they realized that she loved her and what she was doing was for their best interest and for their best future. And um, lots of people did give their memories and they often don't overlap much because each person sort of had their own uh, recollections of what she was like as a teacher and as a person or as a community person. One of the strange things uh, to, to make a little extra money, she raised and sold celery from her garden at her house. Oh, she loved her, her um, of flowers and bushes and so forth, loved roses the best. And one day, a couple boys on the way to school picked some roses off a neighbor's rose bush and took them to Lucy. Well, Lucy knew that they didn't have permission to have those roses, and she whipped them both <laughs> with her ruler. Welcome any other questions or comments for Dell uh, here in the last portion of our program. Well, Dell, I wanna thank you again. Uh, I, I think we've gone through everything in the chat window. Um, I don't see anyone who's unmuted themselves for another question or comment. 
But I wanna thank you for your uh, presentation today. Again, volunteering your time and, and sharing this information about uh, Lucy Sims and her remarkable career. I, I was an educator for just a few brief years and I know how much time and effort is required. And, and I can't imagine the dedication that would go into more, more than 50 years uh, of public service as a teacher. And uh, certainly during this time in COVID-19, we know we're asking a lot of educators. They're taking on additional responsibilities, trying to make sure that no students are left behind. And this is just a re great reminder of if there's an educator in your life um, who is maybe caring for grandchildren or, or people you know, it's a great reminder. Today might be a good day to to send them a thank you note and say, thank you for everything you're doing uh, to attend to the educational needs of our community. And thank you for your public service. And, and Dell, I thank you for your volunteerism as thank well. You. And if you've missed any part of today's program, I know some of you had to join late. Uh, you can view the recording in its entirety at our website. Uh, that is at www.jmu.edu forward slash LLI. Dell, thank you, uh, all of our friends. Uh, be well, take care until next time.